Yo, everybody. Welcome to Off Panel, a weekly interview podcast about all things comics brought to you by Sketch.com. I'm your host, David Harper, and this week's guest is the cartoonist behind comics like Spinning on a Sunbeam, Are You Listening?, and the upcoming Clementine Book One at Skybound Comic. It's Tilly Walden. Thanks for coming on, Tilly. Thanks for having me, David. So we're recording this on Wednesday, May 18th. Are you well into your like promotional window for Clementine? Like, where are you at right now? How how are you doing with all of that? Yeah, you know, we waited to really start doing a lot of the promo because I teach uh, from January to April, and I was like, let's try and wait until I like my my students like fly away, they finish their final projects, they're all okay. So like, I wrap them up in a neat bow, and then when May came around, we were like, okay, it's time to start doing interviews. Like, I had no idea I was doing a podcast today. I have so many interviews back to back. It's like, I, this is a podcast. This is a video recording. This is email. I don't even know. Every day is a surprise, but they keep my calendar really organized. So I just, I know where to put myself. Like I was like Skype 12 PM. Got it. There we go. Well, at least it's not like a press junket. I was just watching a show last night where they had a press junket. I don't think that would be very enjoyable where you just have a person sit down in front of you and ask one question and then bounce out. That seems exhausting. No, too much, too much. Although it is it's weird because I'm talking about Clementine book one to a lot of people while working on book two. And so I'm like a little confused about where Clementine is right now. And I have to be very careful not to say anything about what's going on in book two. Cause I'm, I'm right about to draw, I'm about to pencil the end of book two. Oh, you don't want to spoil yourself or spoil the story or anything. It's hard. I, I really, I want to talk about book two because it's what is so present in my mind. But book one hasn't even come out yet. Yeah. And this is, this is a never ending issue for people who make comics and books is that you're always a year ahead of where everyone else is. Yeah, I remember the first time I realized that I had Faith Aaron Hicks on the podcast and I was I was talking to Faith and I was just like, oh, how did it feel to finish? And she was like, I need a time travel to like a year and a half ago. <laughs> Luckily, I'm doing the Clementine books so fast that I can still remember a lot of how it felt to draw book one. But yeah, it's a never ending problem. I have to ask you a process question because I find like hearing this in my head, because I know that you have the Tegan and Sarah books coming to the duology with the first one coming, I believe, in 2023. Yeah. How? (laughs) That's my question. How? How? It's a great question. Well, luckily, the first book of that duology of my Tegan and Sarah books is done. Um, but I was working on it while I was working on Clementine book one. So I was going back and forth between like walkers and Clementine and darkness. And then on the other side, like Canada and Tegan and Sarah and cuteness and color. And actually schedule wise, it was a nightmare to try to do all that work at once, but more for my, my like kind of creative brain, it was really nice to like leave Clementine's world for a day or two and then come back to it because it gave me so much perspective where when I'd come back and look at what I'd just drawn and I was like, wait a second, like, let me rethink this. Um, Logistically, it was like every day was a marathon. I was drawing so much. My arm and wrist were very tired. Um, And the, the stacks of pages I was producing was, was pretty unreal, but it was also, I do kind of like a challenge. And so I I was kind of game for it. Like no one, no one was holding a gun to my head. Like Tilly, you better finish these books. If I had asked for more time on any of these projects, I would have been given it. Um, But I really wanted to try to get it done. And somehow I did. And now I have book two to finish and the second Tegan and Sarah book to do. How that will all get done? I don't know. I'm not going to think about it yet. I do have to say that is actually foundationally like those two series going on at the same time is kind of nice because, well, first off, it's like you kind of have like a tone change so you can I don't want to make it sound like you need like a, a mental health break after doing the Clementine stuff. But it is a lot of trauma in there, like very specific type of trauma. And then yeah. the other thing, though, is, is you know. One thing I really like about your approach on Clementine is as much as I love the games, you give the character, because of the nature of graphic novels and having as much space in there as you do, it almost feels like you're able to allow her to like grow up as a young person would. And so it's like revisiting, like revisiting what an ordinary, not an ordinary, but an experience in like a non-zombie apocalypse world might almost like reinforce the things you might need to deliver in Clementine's story at the same time. It's so true. I think about that all the time, about the difference between Clementine in the games and Clementine in the graphic novels. And so much of it is that in a graphic novel, there's a plot, but 
there's also a lot of downtime, which is very different from the games where I felt like, I mean, part of the reason the games were so exciting is like every episode and every season, something was happening and it was like escalating constantly. Clementine's just sitting, she's thinking about something, she's having a dream, she's feeling moody, she's talking to someone, she's eating, she's washing her hair, all these little pieces that sort of form her life and form who she is. As much as I was excited to like write a plot for her, I was really excited to write time for her to be on her own and process what happened in the games in order to like bring her on this coming of age story. Yeah, you know, this is kind of a random example of something that I think expresses what you're talking about. But I love the intro to the book, but there's this one moment like when she first gets into a community, uh, it's an Amish community where she meets this guy named Ravi, who's a, a former dentist turned uh, prosthetics creator because, you know, you're in the zombie apocalypse and you don't really get to choose who makes your prosthetics. And he, there's this moment where he, it's just a small moment where he teaches her how to do like a figure eight to wrap the place where her leg was amputated. Yeah. And you can see how Clementine appreciates it, but also doesn't trust it, and all these complicated emotions that Clementine has. But she's, like, amazed by it because she's never had somebody teach this before. And the thing that's really amazing about that is that beat wouldn't exist in the game because of the nature of a game. But it's a really nice moment for Clem in the book. And I don't know. I mean, like, that's one of the interesting things is, like, you're right. With the games, I mean, fundamentally, it's like you finish one of the episodes and it's got, like you did this moment because it's a big plot moment. You did this moment. It's yeah. a big plot moment. But instead in this, it's you get to focus on kind of like the areas in between, if that makes sense. Absolutely. And I think in the games, it was so satisfying to see her and the other characters like, like progress sort of like constantly. And it's, it's nice that in the graphic novels, I feel like, and and in life, if you're a 17 year old girl who's lived through this much trauma and this much craziness in her life, that she can she can go backwards and she can like she can make mistakes. Her progress is a very bumpy road. And I've thought a lot about how I feel like at a certain point you've survived through so much, you're going to have to stop and figure out what all that means. Yeah, absolutely. Well, before we get more into Clementine, I want to kind of go back a bit. Too easy to talk about. I know, I know. It's, God, if only you saw my list of questions, you'd be like, this person <laughs> is insane and they like this book too much. But I want to go back to the beginning for you because I thought your intro to comics was really fascinating. Most people when I talk to, it's like, oh, comic strips, or it's like some random superhero comic, or it's this or that. You started with manga and other books your dad would leave around specifically with the first comic of note being Tezuka's Buddha, yep. which was, I've never seen that one before. I'm curious oh, as yeah. to like what it was that you loved about comics even early on. Well, we found Buddha in a used bookstore and I, I wonder what it is that I love so much about it. I mean, if you've read Buddha by Tezuka, it's, it's like a little silly, but it's pretty dark. I don't think it's accurate much at all about the life of Buddha. I think some parts are accurate, but I also think Tezuka was riffing for parts of it. I had never read a story that felt so epic, but also so kind of micro. There was so much focus on these characters' lives. I remember there were panels where they were eating or they were walking or they were riding a horse, but then there was also so much drama. I guess I, I something about it really just clicked with me. The art was black and white. It was clear. I remember I had a really big aversion to comics that were in color when I was younger. Also comics that used a, like a certain kind of font. I have some mild dyslexia and like certain kinds of comic writing just don't work for me. So a lot of mainstream comics were really hard for me to read. Tezuka's Buddha was just everything that I needed all wrapped up and it's eight books. And so I read the whole series and while I was reading it, I never once was like, I should do this. It wasn't until later that I, I connected the dots that I should make comics. But I'm so glad that I found such a, an interesting and strange series to be the one that really introduced me to comics. I don't know what my sort of art or inclinations or aesthetics would look like if not for Buddha, because there's so much in Buddha, too, that is, I'm pretty sure it was background artists who were drawing a lot of it. It wasn't Tezuka. Mm. But Time, I was under the impression that like Tezuka was the one drawing this cartoony character and then also this huge lush tree behind it where every leaf was drawn 
And that combination of hyper detail and simplicity is one that I still strive for. Well, and that makes a lot of sense because I read that you were a a big Studio Ghibli fan. Like that was a big influence for you as well. And it is interesting. You can see that in your art a lot. Like there's this part in Clementine book one that I really love. It's when Clementine and this character named Amos, uh, a kind of... uh, traveling partner slash uh he's a an amish kid who's on rumspringa which i actually didn't know was a real thing until last night yeah yeah so it, it, yeah. it was they're they're on this uh they're getting onto a ski lift for the first time and for us that seems like an ordinary thing but for them it is like a mix of like sheer terror and like big emotions and like that's one of the things i think makes sense about like ghibli as a background and manga being a background is i can see the expressiveness like where it's the visualization is actually like kind of a look at how it feels it's it's always like the biggest version of it and like when you do emotions like sometimes another moment is like in spinning when uh you're celebrating uh lindsay on the ice and you scream out yeah lindsay kill him and there's this like big moment i mean those i see that in your character acting a lot do you feel like that's a way it manifests itself quite a bit i think that's so true that's very astute i feel i think you know my work far better than i do myself but i think studio ghibli and and manga and tezuka all of it there's a lot of playing with scale yeah and of the drama of huge spaces and then there's also the finding the like kind of the majesty in the ordinary there's a clip somewhere on the on the internet of miyazaki looking out a window at all the roof at all these rooftops and he's like if we look at these rooftops they're all different. And what if you just imagined jumping out of the window and running across these rooftops and you go from this one to that one, this one to that one. And what he's talking about is like anything that you look at, you can find the sort of beauty and intensity in it. And I think about it all the time. So even when I'm drawing something like going up a ski lift for the first time, how high that lift gets, not accurate. But is it accurate for how they're feeling, like the mountains around them, for how the huge distance between their feet and the ground? I mean, for kids in the apocalypse, getting on a working ski lift is unheard of. And also, it was just, it was really fun to draw them trying to get on the bench. Um, oh, God. As, as the one Alaskan who hates winter sports... <laughs> I related very deeply to that scene because the first time I ever went on a ski lift, I was like, I am never doing this again for the rest of my life. This is horrible. I do not like this. <laughs> I did want, you know, one thing that's funny about the, I didn't learn that you loved like Miyazaki stuff until after I read the book. But it's funny because in my notes, I wrote that Amos reminded me of Turnip Head or Prince Justin from Howl's Moving Castle. I don't know if it's the hat. Because it's you're right. There's, it's the innocence. It's the innocence, yeah. And also just like this good natured, I want to help people. Like Turnip Head is always just like jamming himself in places that he doesn't belong just so he can help people. That's it's extremely Amos. Absolutely. I love that. I never made that connection, but you're t- you're totally right. Um I should have used Turnip Head as, as a reference. That would have been <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Turnip Head. But um you okay, so you re- started reading comics. Yes. I read that your desire to write them or create them, mm-hmm. didn't necessarily come together until you went to a two-day workshop in L.A. with Scott McCloud that made you realize graphic novels were what you wanted to do. What was it about that experience that set you on the path? Oh, my God. It was so – I mean, I can I can, I can, can wind back my life and pinpoint the exact moment for, as to why I'm sitting here talking to you about one of my many graphic novels. It's when – at the end of the two-day workshop – the workshop was really fun. Scott was really sweet. There were a bunch of grown-ups there, which for a 16-year-old was, like, very cool. I was like, look at me. I'm with grownups. This is awesome. I'm mature. Um, None of us were any good at comics. So the playing field was extremely level, which was great. And I made a comic about an octopus. And Scott Scott asked us to make, in between the first day and the second day of the workshop, make a one-page comic about your whole life. And I made that comic. And it wasn't wasn't much good but the experience making it was really fun and I still wasn't like oh yeah my future I'm gonna make comics it wasn't until the end of the class everyone was walking out I still remember exactly how the lighting looked in the room as that class was ending and Scott came up to me and I don't remember the wording exactly but the sentiment was you're really good at this you should you should keep it up don't give up kid And I was not, I mean, I grew up in the competitive figure skating world. I was not accustomed to adults ever giving me any positive feedback of any kind. I I would have expected Scott to say, like, you got a lot of work to do. But instead, he was so encouraging. He was so sweet to me. He looked so much like he believed in me. And if you've ever met Scott McLeod, he just has a really kind face. 
And I was so, I was so touched. I felt so loved by him in that moment that I left that room and I was like, I'm going to make comics. That is amazing. And I told him years later, we've talked about it. He, I don't think he entirely remembers doing that, but (laughs) we've laughed about it. Um, He's such, he's such a nice guy and it goes to show. And I think about it when I think about my own students that sometimes encouragement is like, is all we need or just like a little bit of love. Someone to be like, I believe in you. You're good at this. I'm proud of you. And here I am like 10, 20, I don't know, graphic novels later. (laughs) (laughs) He came up to Alaska for a 50 state tour with his daughter uh, opening with a presentation where she just walked through. There was like a slideshow about their experience going to all these other states. First off, I just want to say he's a very good presenter. His daughter is even better. His daughter was like unbelievable. Wow. Unbelievable. But it was it was interesting, though, because I'd been reading comics for years at that point. But and I'd even read Understanding Comics and I'd read his other stuff. It oh, I feel like it really opened my eyes and also like like it's just like his enthusiasm and perspective on the medium was absolutely it was infectious and incredible and it made me kind of I don't know see things in comics I hadn't seen before, which is really impressive. If he told me he believed in me as well, I'd probably be making crap of comics now. But I am very very bad at drawing. Absolutely. But see, you'll get better. And I actually was just talking to I was talking to Ryan North for another publicity thing we were doing. And I, apparently his origin story has to do with Scott McCloud, too. And what? Scott also, like, somehow inspired him. I don't know. Scott mccloud has got, he's done a lot for the comics community. Yeah. Well, he taught at the Center for Cartoon Studies a bit, too, right? He's been a visiting artist, okay. times, I believe. But I don't think, he's never been a, a part of the faculty. But I think he's he has a very positive relationship with the school. And I believe he was a visiting artist when I was a student there as well. So yet another point in my timeline where Scott showed up. That is amazing. I talked to another cartoonist who, her name is Brenna Thumbler, and she had, God, uh, I don't remember who the actual writer of Lemony Snicket is. Oh, Dan Handler. Daniel Handler. Daniel Handler was her uh, Scott McCloud because Lemony Snick, or, you know, Daniel Handler basically told her that she should go for it. And I was just like, oh my God, like Lemony Snicket is telling you to go for this. You got to go for this. And she did. She's an absolutely incredible cartoonist. So. Oh, that's so cool. I do think you're right, though. It's like when you get that encouragement in the right moment, it really can change everything because it's like, you know, you might believe in yourself or try to believe in yourself. But when somebody else does and you can see yourself through their eyes, I, I think that can be like a foundational element for people. Absolutely. And if Scott had been honest with me at that point about how my art actually looked and how my comic skills actually were, which was like level zero. I mean, I was so green and new to it. It wouldn't have worked if he had, I think, told me what it would take to get to where I wanted to get. He made me feel like I was already on my way. And it helped. Do you feel like that experience has kind of affected how you teach when you're at the the Center for Cartoon Studies? Absolutely. I mean, I think every experience I've had both in comics and outside of it affect how I teach. I feel very attached to my students. I want to I want to I want to help them all. I want to save them all even though I can't. But absolutely, I think about it in terms of feedback all the time where some students are just in a place where all they need is encouragement. I need to just kind of like show them that they can do this and that they should believe in themselves. There's nothing more important to me in becoming a cartoonist than in realizing that you're good at this and you can do it, even if that's not totally true. Like like good, solid self-worth is like the best motivation as an artist. And so many of the people who come to our program have been to these other mainstream art schools or they've gone to four-year universities. And so much of the culture of fine art uh, especially is very like very focused on intense critique um on judgment and on sizing yourself up next to others and i feel like everyone should just be like i'm great this is great yeah i was talking to a writer recently Uh, actually it was on my last podcast and uh, they write for the x-men office at marvel and one of the things that's a little bit different in their approach over at that office is you know it's like a lot of times being a comic creator is kind of presented as like a competitive thing where it's like, you know, I have to get mine. And if I get mine, you can't get yours. And that can be a tough environment for people to work in. And that's one of the cool things about that one is it sounds like everyone feels very empowered because 
it's like set up in a way where everyone already has theirs. So it's designed for everyone to be encouraging to each other. And I don't know that that is something that would be really nice. But I, I want to I actually want to talk about your teaching really quick, just because I had uh, uh, Arki Kuo Johnson on a little while back and he teaches at RISD. And yeah. one thing that he finds is that teaching really inspires him and that the energy of his students makes him want to push himself in ways that he wouldn't have imagined before. Do you find that the same to be true for you? I think it's true. I think, you know, it's 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 multifaceted, right? If if I wasn't teaching, I'd have more time to work. But teaching sort of fuels my work. There's definitely times where I get I get drained from teaching. And so I feel like I have nothing left for my comics. And it's this, it's sort of a constant push and pull of figuring out where that line is for myself. How do I, how do I take care of my students? How do I take care of myself? But in general, what I've noticed is that I'm so much better because of them at analyzing comics and about thinking about the actual physical steps we take to get better at doing this. Because nothing I think is worse as a teacher of comics when you're just like, that could be better. I mean, what? Can, where am I supposed to go with that? I mean, yeah. literally thinking about like, if this character moved two inches this way, if you use this pen, if this panel was different, if this part of the story came to the forefront more. So analyzing my students' work has helped me analyze my work so much better to the point where there were there was a lot of back and forth in Clementine book one. We did a lot of editing um, to make everything really come together. And I learned so much from that process that book two has been a lot smoother because I feel like I'm taking the lessons I've learned from book one, but also from the students I had this last year and the year before. And I'm applying what I told them about story. I'm like, what is the purpose of this scene? Why is this here? What is the trajectory? Um, so yeah, that's a long-winded way to say, absolutely. Teaching teaching is a huge ins- inspiration. It's also a ton of work. Yeah. Um, and I get I get super tired, but I only teach one semester a year. So I just teach from January to April. And my my wife teaches the other semester. So when I'm teaching, she's supporting me. When she's teaching, I'm supporting her. And now, a quick word from one of off panel sponsors. Macroverse is a next generation digital comics platform and one with an astonishing number of comics with currently over 50 series from over 100 creators on their app with a five star rating both on Apple and Google's app stores. Download the app and binge all their titles, including the Eisner-nominated Remind from Jason Brubaker, Lisa K. Weber's Hex 11, which has been described as Harry Potter meets Blade Runner, or the new queer supernatural adventure series Husk that launches on November 1st. It's just $4.99 a month to subscribe to Macroverse, with proceeds directly supporting the creators on the platform. Keep an eye on the future of Macroverse 2, as 2022 is going to bring an epic upgrade that offers a new level of digital collectability and more, with early adopters able to sign up for more information at Macroverse.com. And now, back to the show. You know, it is interesting hearing you talk about that because uh, talking about how you're kind of like looking at things like a little bit different. And like one thing I really like in Clementine is there are some scenes where I don't know precisely the emotion that's going through Clementine's head. But there are these moments where Clem is kind of like only half on the panel and kind of cut off by like the the panel border or something like that. Or you only see like her eye for, for this moment. And I'm not saying that you've never done that before, but it was really interesting because... A lot of, I think, you know, comic creators or cartoonists wouldn't do something like that because a lot of times the traditional idea for a comic art is like centering on the action or like. Absolutely. And for you, I really like that because it brought into question like the emotions that Clementine's going through. And I think being present in the emotions is a really core part of the story. So it's interesting to see you do that with your art in such a uh, specific way. It's been really fun. I, I would never, I don't think I would keep being a cartoonist if I didn't feel like every project there was potential to grow and change because otherwise I think I'd get bored and and I would feel stuck in one place and I thought about that a lot with Clementine and it's something I've I've talked about more with my students this last semester about how when we don't show something or when we only see part of something the readers like heart and mind have to sort of fill in the gaps and it can sometimes create so much more connection Whereas when I show her whole face and she's sad and you look at it and you're like, she is sad. Okay, moving on. But yeah, it's like, it's that mystery and that, and I think about too, and and I think we talked about this in class as well, how in life we so often don't see the full picture of things and the things we react to, we see so 
partially. And I think about it a lot when I draw environments too. It makes me crazy when people draw environments and it's just like, ah, yes, a clear view of everything I need to see for this plot. Whereas when I go outside into our yard, we live in the forest, basically. There's like trees falling over. There's a branch in the way here. My car's over there. There's a power line here. I mean, everything is, is cut off, but what it does visually is it creates doorways. So when I look outside, I see all these different pathways I could walk down. Mm -hmm. And that's what I was thinking about a lot when it came to the compositions in Clementine. Yeah, it reminds me that, that Brenda Thumbler I mentioned um, in her book, Delicates, there's this one scene where it's like uh, the main character is biking across the top panel. And it's interesting because mm -hmm. she made the choice to not center her, not put it at the beginning of the panel where you would normally think left to right action, but at the end yeah. of it. And it's really, oh, nice. and I love that. And it was funny because like I talked to her about that beat in specific because it was such an atypical choice. I don't want to say unusual choice. It was the right choice. But hearing you talk about that, that that's very true. I think back to um, before I met my wife, she remembers seeing me once, not me. She remembers seeing a shirt I have. And it was it was because it was like a snippet that she had. And that's how life works, right? It's like sometimes yeah. you just get a snippet, something that like brings back a memory later on when you see it again. I don't know. I think that's one of the cool things with comic art, right? Is you get a you get a touch on those snippets if you choose to make that decision. Absolutely. It's so fun. I mean, comics have it's it's agonizing the amount of choices I have when I <laughs> when I draw a panel. I'm like, she could be anywhere in here. It could be any any position close up far away um so that there's an agony to it but there's also so much excitement to it because we're never done figuring out what the potential is for sequential art right i mean it's just exponential the thing that i think is really funny about clementine i thought about this last night when i was rereading it is the telltale walking dead games that it is a continuation of are fundamentally built off of the person engaging with it making the choices yeah you're the only person who's playing the game now i know it's really strange it, it is would be really different if the games had been a different kind of video game but it's it's a very unique situation to be the one sort of the one player that's a great way to describe it it's interesting because i wonder if that makes that fact that you you as the player, not you as the cartoonist, you as the player yeah. make those choices. I wonder if that changes like the investment level of the people who are engaged with it because you made the choices that took Clementine down that path and now seeing somebody else. I don't know. It's it's There's some interesting psychology to that. I, I don't mean to take us down a dark path. Super interesting psychology. I mean, how people will feel after having played the games and reading the book, I think it's like, it's all up to them. Yeah. So it's like, for me, it's my, ch I'm choosing for Clementine in these this journey across these three books but then it is still the readers and the players choice to decide like how they feel about it and what they take away from that's true what they take away from it yeah okay so let me get into the solicit because we're here to primarily talk about clementine book one your yes. graphic novel that arrives on june 22nd with gray tones excellent gray tones by cliff rathburn Ooh, so good thank you cliff that's the, the first part of a trilogy. Here's the solicit. The trilogy marks the graphic novel debut of Clementine, star of the massively successful Telltale uh, Games video game. Uh, in book one, Clementine discovers new allies, new rivals, and new love. But as the group tries to find a walker-free settlement in an abandoned ski resort, they soon discover that the biggest threat to their survival is each other. Uh, Ooh, very it's, dramatic. It's absolutely amazing. I loved it. Uh, as I noted before, I took notes while reading the book for the first time. And so impressed. They may seem like the ramblings of a lunatic. There were a, there were a lot. Uh, but that just means I was very into it. And uh, I do think, you know, this story is you getting involved with a character in a world that I would say people are invested in. Let's say that. Uh, so, so it's a bit different than your typical project because it's not like anyone was invested in on a sunbeam before because they didn't know it existed because you created it whole cloth. It's true. How did this project come together? You know, it came together the way so many projects do it. It lacks a lot of drama and yet, you know, it it was life changing how it what happened after, but it it was an email. You know, I was lying on my floor on a hot day in my apartment checking my email and I saw something about Clementine and the Walking Dead and I was like, what is this? Um and I was on a break from my books and I really wasn't too busy at the time and it was skybound and they were reaching out to see if I'd be interested in taking on this project. And I went ahead and played the games. I hadn't played them before, got really invested. And I was like, absolutely, let's do it. <laughs> this sounds like so much fun. Um, and part of why I was so inclined to take on the project is because it was 
so different from everything I had done before. And I really, I was really surprised that anyone from The Walking Dead would think that I would be a good fit. But after thinking about it, I was like, I think I can do something interesting here. I think that my inclinations and aesthetics as a storyteller could be kind of a fun pair yeah. with Clementine. And it helped that she was canonically queer. I was like, great. Yeah. I'll take that. Sean Makowitz told me that it was happening before it was announced. I'm, I'm pretty sure I screamed at him as a response. It was great. That's so sweet. I'm so charmed. As soon as I heard that it was a perfect fit. And uh, I was like, oh my God, that is incredible. I was like, was like your entire list just tilling? And he was like, yeah. Pretty much. That was that was just it. Oh, I'm so I'm so honored. But I, you know, I do think it's a really good fit for you. Like I read an interview you did with NPR where you talked about on a sunbeam, and in it you said what really interests you about the concept of people kind of coming in and out of your life is when there's someone in your life who you both desperately miss and have learned to live without. Mm. That was back in 2018, but it's interesting because like you could say that about Clementine as well. And this is a character who says about her life in the zombie apocalypse with an understandable amount of sadness behind it that's the whole problem i keep making it yeah in that regard i feel like clementine really is like a perfect character for you is that part of what appealed to you about taking on this project once you played the games and started to understand who she was and everything absolutely absolutely i mean it was great because she's this young girl we see her grow up i think thinking about who you become as an adult uh, based on what has happened to you is like a never endingly interesting concept to play with in stories for me. And so being sort of gifted and handed her backstory through the games and also having a part in it, you know, being able to play as her and make choices as her. I was very invested in the choices I made and who I saved and who I didn't and who she kissed and who she didn't. It felt really special. It felt in a way similar to how other projects have felt where like when I started on a Sunbeam or any other original graphic novel I've done, you think about the idea and it kind of lives inside you for a while before you, you put it down on paper. And rather than thinking about the idea of Clementine, that stage of the process was playing the games and getting to know her. And in that way, she's sort of like melted inside of me. I thought about her every day. And then I was like, okay, now I'm ready. I'm ready to take on her story. And I didn't pitch to them the whole series. I was just like, here's what the first book is. Who knows with books two and three? They were fine with that. We're now dealing with the consequences of that <laughs> as I continue the series, but it's okay have trust in me. It's going to be great. I did set up plenty of stuff for book two and book one. Maybe it's somewhere in your notes. I don't know if you noticed anything, but, but yeah, it's, it all came together. It really, it's really been a lot of fun and a lot of work. I mean, where the book ends and I'm not going to say anything about it. You literally could go anywhere. I mean, very literally, <laughs> which is perfect. I mean, it's going to be amazing. Like where everything lands next is going to be an amazing thing. But so was that, was the playing the game, the primary fuel for developing the story? Or did you kind of have conversations with people from like Skybound or maybe even like the Telltale story team? Or is it mostly just like from your filter? They, they asked me right off the bat. They were like, do you want to tell stories about Clementine within her time in the games? Or do you want to tell stories about Clementine after? And I was like, after, yes. absolutely. Because I can't help but find other sources of inspiration outside of Clementine that I then applied to her story. So I played the games and they got me invested in the character. But then it was like starting from scratch. I was like, if Clementine wasn't here, what story would I write right now? And actually, I had been like quietly working on my own kind of apocalyptic story outside of Clementine. And I ended up drawing a lot on what I had started in that story and applying it to Clementine. But so much of the story came out of the location of Vermont, where I was living at the time and where I live right now, and thinking about what it would mean for her to go north and to be on this mountain. And so I guess the games weren't really a direct inspiration for the story because I was trying to think about what would be my own personal inspiration for her this for this graphic novel? Because I was going to have to sit down and draw like 300 pages. I was like, I better be excited about whatever concepts I'm going to put in this. And so it was about marrying the two things, marrying the um, the feelings I had for Clementine as a character from the games and and with uh, what I was interested in that moment, which was like, you know, the Amish uh, <laughs> um, and a few different things that I won't bring up. 
Yeah, I, I love it. I mean, in the book itself, I don't think this counts as a spoiler, but there are like elements of the game that show up where it's like, I mean, here's here's the funny thing. It's like I say elements of the game, but at this point, we're talking about Clementine's memories. We're talking about yeah, Lee exactly. or AJ or whomever showing up because those are people who affected her and led her on this path. But I think one really important thing, and I know this is kind of an odd distinction, but I think you're going to buy what I'm selling. Let's hear it. This book is not about the games. It's about Clementine. And that is a really important choice. That's a great way to describe it. I'm going to steal that and use that in my interview tomorrow. That's really good. <laughs> good. It's it's so true. She is She is her own character in her own world in this series. And she has, I think, she has a different level of autonomy because... I mean, I'm making decisions for her, I'm writing her, but no one else gets a say in in where she goes. And I do think there is something like a little empowering about that, about like this young girl getting to a place where it's like, you know what, I'm going this direction, this is what I'm going to do, these are the people I'm going to keep close to me in my life. Well, and think about all the things that you get to explore that almost never explored in these types of stories. Uh, she's a queer character, she mm -hmm. is an amputee. Yeah. I'm not trying to compare this, but at the same time, like... I definitely have never seen the Amish in a zombie apocalypse story. And like being able to see that, frankly, as soon as I saw that, I was like, oh, my God, I bet they are like acing the zombie apocalypse. Because if I was in the zombie apocalypse, people would be like, make a fire. I'm like, I'm going to die. But the, the Amish are already like predisposed to being badasses at this, which is pretty, pretty perfect. But it is interesting because part of the reason why everybody fell in love with Clem was because the people who were telling the stories in those games had the opportunity to tell the stories that they wanted to tell. This is just you continuing her story and exploring the things that are interesting to you as a storyteller, whether that's Rumspringa or, you know, figuring out how she deals with, um, you know, being an amputee in this experience, which would be obviously a tremendous hardship. Oh, absolutely. And it's, you know, the story is my own, but so much about it would not exist without not only the help of my editor, but we've had a lot of consultations with uh, unilater unilateral amputees, below the knee, above the knee amputees, um, people with different disabilities, to try to really genuinely understand what life in the apocalypse would be like um, as a disabled person, because I don't have that experience even not in the apocalypse. And so it really is a huge blind spot for me as to how that would go for her. And I, I I was really, in, I tried to be intentional and I was intentional with a lot of help about taking the time in the story to show things like, how do you put a bandage um, on her residual limb? How do, how does her cane work? How does she walk with it? Um, what does phantom pain feel like? And it's something I want to continue doing in the series for how, what life is like as an amputee after two years, after three years, as time goes on, as you get older, um, as you have new experiences. A very lovely bit of cartooning is when she's taking her first steps with her new prosthetic. Yeah. And she's going, oh, as she's as she's like, <laughs> like kind of shaking. I love that. I actually, that was one of my many, many notes. I was like, the O's are great. If I had even more time, if this book was like 600 pages, which it couldn't be, I would have loved to even slow down the journey further because it's still a little fast how fast she adjusts to her prosthetic, how often she wears it and how much time she spends on her feet um she would be spending a lot more time sitting down and recovering from all of this but for the plot's sake we did have to accelerate that timeline a bit but ugh, if i had, had 600 pages you'd be taking that thing off let her let her rest well and also there's always nice touches in there too it's like when she first hears the term residual like she's immediately like my what like resid and like gets cut off big word like that's she doesn't have books on this. She doesn't have people telling her what to do with this stuff. Like, she's learning on a fly. I mean, like, that's... I think that's one of the cool things about the book is, like, Clementine has always been a character of action. And now Clementine is in a position where she kind of is learning in a way that she's never had a chance to. And it's it's really it's really interesting to see... I say this as, as a fan of the games. It is very much the Clementine of the games, but at the same time, like you're being able to take her in directions that she doesn't. You're like, you're making your own zombie apocalypse, Tilly. I'm trying to, but you know what? It's funny you bring that up because that's actually now where I'm at with, with book two and, and getting close to kind of the halfway point on, on working on this series. It's been the most surprising and most fulfilling part of the series is thinking about what she understands about the world and what she has yet to learn. When you think about education, it's not just school. There's so much context you learn growing up in like an average world without any walkers. And thinking about how she learns and understands the world around her has been so much fun. The amount of stuff I want to put in these books, there isn't space for it because 
there's just too much, but I do, I do hope to continue that, that idea of she's really great at surviving, but what does it mean if she ever has to measure something? Does she know what a centimeter is? Probably not. But also how empowering as a kid to learn about this entire other world that you haven't had time to have access to, which is, all right, I'm going to go. I could talk about this endlessly. It is really fascinating though. Cause like fundamentally in the story, I don't think this counts as a spoiler because I think it's in in the solicit is like these young people who basically I don't mean this to diminish them, but didn't know anything when they went into the zombie apocalypse. They were children yeah. are now trying to build something like my wife is an architect. <laughs> Good luck. It's hard enough for them. And she went to college for it. Trying to be a kid who grew up like seven years old, you got turned into the zombie apocalypse and all of a sudden you're like, all right, build this. What? Yeah, what's the frame of a house? How does that work? I couldn't do that. I'm 38. I know nothing about that stuff. I'd be a disaster. They're so hardcore, these kids. Oh, they are really hardcore. I mean, that is an understatement, I would say. But, um, you know, it is funny, though. I mean, it's like you think about it. It's like the valuation system of a zombie apocalypse is so crazy, obviously, because it's like you prioritize like survival skills, like knife fighting skills. I'm like listing these things off like it's Napoleon Dynamite right now. But those are the things you value. And it's you, I like that you take the time to have them read and kind of learn words together and stuff like that. Like those are nice little moments. I mean, I also think they'd be so bored. Oh, there yeah. There's a lot of downtime between like a zombie that you kill and the next zombie and how these how these kids fill their time. I think is is so important in discovering who they are, especially for Clementine. Yeah, I do want to make one reference to something that crosses over in the game. For for people who love the game, there are references that are very effective. Learning the name of Clem's prosthetic nearly wrecked me. <laughs> <laughs> are you going to say it, or we'll let people? Decide? I'm not. I'm not. That gets down to it too. Is is like um, Clem, like I am being right now, is uh, fundamentally uh, withholds information. Like Ricka, uh, am I pronouncing that right? Yeah, yeah that's right. Like Ricka is a fantastic character, feels very you. But she's like kind of the opposite of Clem in some ways, which is why she's a very necessary character because you need somebody to kind of drag her out of her shell because she's used to not trusting anyone. And yeah. I don't know, in like a lot of ways, it's like I feel like this, this book series is ultimately going to be about growing up, but it's also going to be about Clementine. Rem- remembering how to be a person yeah and like discovering that she gets a say in what kind of person she gets to be right you know what and i think about when you restart the world when you devastate it and it's rebuilt the values and the experiences of the people rebuilding it will shape it and i think that in many ways the world that clementine is rebuilding is very damaged and very broken but also far better than the one that she left behind And now, a quick word from one of Off Panel's sponsors. That sponsor is Bad Idea. Bad Idea paid for the sponsorship, but they won't give me anything to promote since they're over. So here I am saying the name Bad Idea. Contractually. I have to. That's it. Bad Idea. Their thing, I guess. And now, back to the show. So, you know, I mentioned, like, other children, other young people. Yeah. I love how you built out the cast, like, especially considering the fact where both Clem and gamers were likely coming from with her story. I have proof of this in my very long email thread, but I trusted no one in this story. I go into it because yeah. I'm coming from Clem's perspective, <laughs> not trusting anyone. I'm like, you're bad. You're bad. You're bad. I know what's going on with this Amish community. I don't trust this Amish community. Get out of here. This is bad news. Funny. Yeah. But that's how Clem feels, too. And yeah. was that an, you know, an interesting dynamic to play with, like both having Clem on the defensive naturally, but also trying to find a way to tear down those walls. Totally. Oh my God. It's it's the whole meat of the story. It's It was my whole job as a storyteller is to try to think about why were there walls in the first place? Why does she feel this way about the world? And how is she going to pick away at her side of the wall? And how are the other people around her that love her and care about her going to pick away at their side? And then like somehow they like there's a hole in the rock and they can meet to each other. Yeah, it's it's so much fun. It's so interesting um, to think about. There's also <laughs> reading the um, God, I don't even know acknowledgments. No, like the, the the thank you in the back from you. I did think it was really interesting yeah, okay. that there was an uh, Olivia and a Georgia thanked in the back. And I was like, is that? <laughs> That's my wife's sister's name. OK, <laughs> So technically my two of my sisters-in-law. When I was writing the book, I was like, I need more female names. I don't know what to do. I was just like, Olivia and Georgia, it's fine. Georgia's going to be like, 
what the hell? <laughs> I know. I know. Oh, my God. I don't think they've read the book yet. I'll have to give them a copy. Oh, my God. It's incredible. It's incredible. Okay. Well, I want to talk about some some larger process stuff. Do you think art first when it comes to your comics? Like, is, is that your natural lean or kind of writing and drawing kind of co-pilots in your approach? It's, it's art first. Absolutely. I don't script. I make an outline because I have to, and then I ignore it and draw a different book, much to the chagrin of my editor. Sorry, Alex, if you're listening. Um, I haven't looked at the outline for book two at all as I've been (laughs) penciling it. Um, So is it kind of improvisational? It is. It's very improvisational, um, which is one of the reasons my books are heavily edited. I do a lot of reworking and a lot of rewriting in order to make it a cohesive and good book. But when I am drawing the book for the first time when I pencil it I don't I don't thumbnail it I don't plan the pages out ahead of time I'm writing the dialogue as I'm drawing the characters and so it, while it is art first I am I am really thinking about the words as I'm drawing so it's like this weird comics thing where I like both cylinders are firing at the same time. This reminds me of, bizarrely, the second straight podcast I've referenced this movie, the movie Arrival, where there's like the, I don't know if you've seen that, there's like the language where it's like, they like have to for, they go from both sides and they connect in the middle. And it's like the only way you know how to do that is if you can know where you're starting and where you're ending simultaneously. And that kind of, I mean, I'm not saying that like that's how you're doing it precisely, but it's what it sounds like. Yes. That's true. Yeah. It's true. Yeah, I do. I like I know the end of of book 2 and right now my my struggle in life is that I got to like logistically I got to get her there. Um and I think it was true for book 1 too. I knew exactly where it was going to end and I knew where it was going to start and it's like a matter of how how do I connect those dots? I don't know how else anyone would write a book. This is like a super diminishing way to put it, but at the same time I feel like it's true. You are basically you're doing a choose your own venture graphic novel no it's totally true it's totally true and then sometimes i'm like i'm out of choices i don't know what to do i'm totally (laughs) lost as to how to get her from point a to point b emotionally and physically when i talk to creators one of the things that i think is is like a very underrated creative environment is when you talk to people sometimes getting put into a box is actually one of the most creative places to be because it's like you have to find your way out oh yeah boundaries and restrictions um of any kind absolutely help the creative process. I never would have written this book if Clementine hadn't been the sort of starting box that I was in. But she, being sort of in her universe and, and stuck within the bounds of her world ended up being so creatively fulfilling. If I was just like starting a book right now and trying to write it, way harder. Is that one of the, you know, having that box to start with, was that one of like the appeals to like taking on the project to begin with? Because I'm not I'm not trying to like demean anything or do anything like that. But it's like I think one of the fascinating things about this is is you're in a position where you are a cartoonist of the highest renown and like (laughs) and you you do all these amazing books and then you take on a for hire project where you're working in the Walking Dead universe. Yeah, And and then you have these Walking Dead super fans who are like, oh, my God, anybody touches this and you're the literal devil, blah, blah, blah. So you have these like two sides that are coming against you. But. So as a, on an outside, it could be easily understandable if you passed on it. You chose, oh, sure. you chose to be within that box. Was that one of the big appeals to it, is trying to like find solutions within all of those things that are kind of pushing against you a bit? Absolutely. It's a, it's a new chance for me to discover something new as a storyteller, to get better, to challenge myself. It was, I mean, it was a fascinating idea. I've always known about The Walking Dead. I loved it when I was younger. My dad was a huge fan too. I was like, yeah, I want to try and do a Walking Dead comic. Who cares what people say? It's as a creator, because this is my job, I want to feel it's like we talked about before. Every time I take on a new project, I want to feel like I'm going somewhere new. And this was an amazing opportunity to walk into a world I never would have thought to walk into. I kind of feel like you're Clementine. Oh, my God. I wish. (laughs) Who knows? Uh Oh God, she's tougher than everybody. She's she's really tough. She's tough, but she's also far softer than I think people give her credit for. Um, yeah, I mean, I also can't help but write Clementine in a way that I would write myself. You can never really take yourself out of the equation. Sure. But it's interesting thinking about like where I start and Clementine ends and how we how we mesh. Yeah, and and I know what you're saying. It's like she is tough, but like there's this one scene that you you depict her right after she leaves the Amish and she goes up in a tree and she opens her bag and she finds this hat and like this hat is like kind of these gifts are are very 
like they soften her in a way that you don't often see her get softened. And she seems satisfied in a way that she rarely is. She just kind of like puts the hat down over her eyes and kind of goes to sleep up in this tree. I wouldn't even be able to sleep in the tree. I would fall out of the tree. I've fallen out of bunk beds before. I don't know if people can actually sleep in trees. I mean, maybe if there were actual dead walking around trying to eat me, I'd be like, yeah, okay. I think you would find a way. Yeah, you'd find a way. She's also still young. She's agile. Her knees, great shape. Great shape. Yeah. 10 years, I don't know. Rough. I definitely wouldn't. I would fall out and I would just be easy zombie food. Even if I even got that far, that's 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 pretty far for me. But I, I don't know. I have... I have to bring up one other like character acting note. There is one thing I really love that you do with Amos. Amos is a fantastic character. He is such a charming character, not just because he's like turnip head, but you do this thing with him whenever he's sure of what he's saying. He closes his eyes. You depict him with his eyes closed. Oh, right. It's such a nice touch. It's just like, oh my God, this guy is like, he reminds me of a friend of my wife and I's who my wife has described in the past as if he was like born into the world without knowing that evil existed where he's just purely innocent and like that is a tough thing to be in the zombie apocalypse it is but you know there is something really tough about being innocent right like Amos's decision to stay the way he is in the face of it all i think shows that deep down he is like he is lethal he can he defends who he is and in that way i think he's a huge inspiration to clementine because he's found a way to let the trauma sort of wash off his back because I also, I don't think he's had an easy life. I don't dive into Amos's backstory too much in the story, but I do have ideas about what it is he's been through. No one's had an easy life. He's too good with a hatchet to have had an easy life. Yeah, that's true. I do think that one of the most savage things that happens to him, in the book is when Clementine says, I have some cold experience, but yours is all new. And, I'm, and he just laughs about it. Like that's a fundamental Clem Amos moment because it's like he gets straight up roasted and he's like oh you're hilarious oh great friend great friend I know. Oh, uh, it's great you know it's, I was thinking about it in a lot of comics and stories I, I it happens it happens a lot more these days but just like like a teenage boy and a teenage girl really just being friends oh, and yeah. never really letting it go to that like but what if will they won't they it's like their their friendship is so deep and they have so much trust with each other. I was really happy to write that. I, I mean, the majority of my friends are, are women, like just platonic women friends. Mm-hmm. And I just like, I don't know. It, it is really nice to see that relationship because it's just about them watching out for each other and building that yeah. trust over their like 10 day journey to like killing is Killington Mountain. Yeah. Yeah. It's near you too, right? That name is is like when I, I was like, let's put it at Killington. They were like, come on. <laughs> You don't have to make up mountains, Tilly. It is. Yeah, it's not It's not too far from me. We actually drove up to take pictures to do some research. I read that you really like drawing the snow. Is that because it's just white? Or is it because you actually really like drawing snow? Both. Snow is great because you really don't have to draw that much. But I mean, I, I do live in Vermont and, and we get a ton of snow. And seeing how it all falls and hangs and interacts with the world is snow's wild it's got such a personality it's like you think i couldn't be here i'm here right now i managed to find a way to balance you know two feet of snow on this leaf so i i like thinking about snow too i mean it's just a it's a different form of water and like water is like something that basically can get into anything snow also gets into anything my my roof right now which has holes in it because of uh disrepair because of snow We'll definitely agree with that statement. But um, I did want to bring up your collaborator because you don't normally have somebody you work with on your your graphic novels. You worked with Cliff Rathburn. He did gray tones on this. And, and, And he is a constant in the Walking Dead universe. He's like, he's everywhere. Was that part of where that came from is just to have that visual consistency in the Walking Dead universe or 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 how did that come to be? You know, I think the visual consistency was part of it, but I also just don't really know how to do gray tones the way Cliff could. We were also running out of time to get book one done. Initially, the conceit, we thought I would do the gray tones, but when time sort of forced us to make a choice and Cliff did some test pages for us, we were all like, oh my, oh my God, this looks fantastic. I could not be more grateful or more excited for how the book looks because of Cliff and the fact that it does sort of fit in visually with the other Walking Dead books and with with the world at large is just an added delightful bonus for me I think I think everyone would have been okay if the book looked different but 
I I just could not be happier with with what Cliff did, and I'm so pumped to see him do the rest of the series. Well, it's it's really interesting because it reminds me of like um, you know in some comics like you you would have like uh, if there was like let's say a superhero universe or something you would have the same colorist so they're like kind of yeah. the connective tissue of all of that. And right. well, you know, I actually think your art is I don't know like it, it's uniquely it, it feels very fitting for both the zombie apocalypse but also i mean you know you're you're just great at teen stories you're great at ya stories so you you fit this really well but it's interesting because like i feel like you're a natural fit but it's almost like cliff's gray tones are kind of like that foot in the door with people who might be a little skeptical if that makes sense absolutely it's like they've seen it before it's comforting it's a reminder right it's like they've they've walked into this world before they've seen how this feels but i also think cliff just continues to elevate his game like he never stops getting better and he is so fast oh my god some days i'm like i'm fast i'm fast at things no cliff is fast cliff is actually fast and he lives in vermont oh that's perfect that that works out really well i feel like you're both fast you're both really fast we were talking earlier about the fact that you are basically doing like i don't know five graphic novels in like a three or four uh, you know Sleep's overrated. I, I just have a couple more questions. I had a comic artist ask about the book yesterday because we were talking about you coming on. I had recommended On a Sunbeam to him a while ago, and he absolutely loved it. He said, he asked, he was like, would this work for a non-Walking Dead fan? And I said, absolutely, it definitely would work. Because you kind of, one of the nice things about what you do is everything you need to know about what Clementine's going through in her past, you kind of introduce in the story. Yeah. Was making it accessible a crucial part of the way you approached it? Crucial. Huge. I mean, it's it was important to do justice to Clementine, but it was also so important that anyone who has no idea who Clementine is, who's never seen The Walking Dead, never read The Walking Dead, never played the games, doesn't even like zombies. I was I wanted to make a book too for someone who was like, ugh, zombie stuff, not for me. Because I mean, this is gonna sound so silly, but the apocalypse is for everyone. Like these kinds of stories are so open as to as to their potential and to who can read them and who can enjoy them. So it was, I mean, one of the most important parts of developing this story and this series is that anyone can read it. Hopefully anyone can enjoy it. And, and it can, I don't know, be like this next step for where we're going to take the walking dead as a whole because it's been around for a long time and it's lived through many different iterations i don't think it sounds silly that you said like the apocalypse is for everybody because horror is going through this crazy renaissance over the last few years and i do think that there's something weirdly relatable about horror in a unexplainable way i mean i think part of it is like the fact that fear is very universal it's like we all know what it is to be afraid but it's also like it's a hypothetical situation where you can't help but feel like what you would be like in that situation I, you know, maybe zombies isn't aren't for everyone, but everyone can kind of see themselves in that situation and be like, what would I be like? Yeah. And zombies, I thought a lot about this. Zombies are actually a fantastic apocalyptic villain and, and a fantastic villain in general because they are like the pure manifestation of everything you're afraid of. And they're right there in front of you. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. much about stories that deal with fear is about what we can't see. And I think there's actually something really comforting in knowing your enemy right there. Well, and of course, what The Walking Dead as a whole deals with is that it's not usually the walkers that are your biggest problem. Right. Um, Thus, Clem's but, trust but issues. Still, right? Hence the trust issues. And I think reading apocalyptic stories is great because they're alive. They're living through it. And so much about thinking about the end of the world is is being afraid that you're not going to get the chance to see what happens or to live through it. And every apocalyptic story, even with death, has to exist with the characters experiencing it. And so we get to put ourselves in those shoes and we get to secretly tell ourselves, you're going to be okay. You're going to live through this. I'm going to bring up something that might be open up a can of worms. Did you watch Station Eleven? Absolutely. I I read the book long ago. The book's amazing too, yeah. I loved it. And I thought the show was a great interpretation of the book. I think one thing that the the show did in particular, or did well in particular, was that um, it really looked at like, it skipped past all of like the really bad parts where like everybody was dying (laughs) and like on the road. It was just like, what happens to society now? Yeah. 
And I do think that's, I mean, that's part of the thing that's interesting about where Clem's at is like, how old is Clem at this point? Is she 17? She's 17 in book one, yeah. So she's been alive for 17 years, 10 of which have been in the zombie apocalypse. She knows zombie apocalypse more than she knows what real life is, or excuse me, normal life is like. That's unfair. Real life for her is the zombie apocalypse. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think that that is really fertile ground to touch on is, you know, what would that be like to a young person when you've never known anything different effectively? I know. And like your dating pool is just other people who experience the same thing. It's like, <laughs> what do you talk about? Like you can't bring up TV shows or whatever. You're just like, okay, uh, what's, what's the most walkers you've killed in a single sitting? It's like, ah, yeah. How do you casually relate to anyone? It's, it's really, and then you're contending with these older people who do nothing but remember yeah. what was before. So I love I love thinking about that that really there's got to be a really intense generational divide between those who remember and lived most of their life before and those who lived after. And I feel like it would create a lot of tension. See book 2 for more. <laughs> Shouts to Rabbi for being a real one. Just helps people. Hanging in there. Dentist turned prosthetist. Just does like, uh, helps young people out, does his thing and teaches people stuff. What a gem. What a gem. But uh, like Scott McCloud, we need nice adults in our life. Exactly. We just need somebody to tell us everything is going to be okay and you're good at what you do. Sometimes it's being a cartoonist. Other times it's stabbing undead in the head. Yeah. Oof. It takes all types. I know. I do want to say, uh, this is the last thing I'm going to bring up. The favorite thing I came across in all of the interviews you've done was when someone asked you, I think it was like a previews, ma- like a previews magazine interview where they asked like, what would you say to your characters? And you said effectively, it was, it was a perfect answer. You said, I'd invite them in for dinner and a shower and to have a roof over their heads for a little bit because uh, oh, first, yeah. I love that answer because that. that should be the answer, but I am guessing that is not what they expected. But like, man, can you imagine that if you're a zombie apocalypse and all of a sudden you're like, electricity? Like food? Showers? What? Oh, yeah. And honestly, they would be so suspicious of me and I'd worried that my own characters would like kill me in my sleep and steal all the <laughs> food that I would get them a room at like a comfort inn and be like, go for it. Go wild. <laughs> Eat that complimentary breakfast. Enjoy it. Ask them how to use the waffle maker. You will not know how to use it. Don't forget to give a Yelp review. Yeah. Comfort, a shower. I mean, all all those simple necessities. I mean, those are the things that they're missing out on. Those are the, the real life things that they don't have. And I think that's why it's really interesting to read your version of, of Clementine in this world is like, you know, I think it's always really interesting to get insights into worlds that people love, but from other perspectives, because you see other people's value systems ringing through. And like that can be a really fertile ground to dive into. Definitely. I mean, I can't make a Clementine book and not bring up her period because I just like logistically having a period in the apocalypse has got to be so annoying. But also all the stress and trauma means a lot of them are probably not having periods because they're so messed up from all the stuff that's happened to them. But yeah, it's I feel like when you see different perspectives on a world like The Walking Dead, all it does is make the world bigger. And it's okay if my perspective isn't for everybody, because the world of The Walking Dead is so big. I feel like whatever you want from it, you can find. I'll tell you what, Tilly, your perspective is for me because I love the book. Thank you. I will spare you more compliments. That's all I have for you, Tilly. Thank you so much for coming on to talk about Clementine, uh, your career, and the way you approach comics. I love it all. Thanks, David. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Off Panel with cartoonist Tilly Walden. You can find her work in the upcoming Clementine Book One from Skybound Comic. Also, big thanks to Deanna Chapman for stepping in to edit this podcast. Deanna is the best. Love Off Panel and want to support it? Subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts today and give the show a rating or review while you're at it, but five stars only. You can also support the show by backing on Patreon. Find the show at patreon.com slash off panel. And when you back it on there, you get early access to each week's podcast as well as weekly content and more. Want even more? Subscribe to my subscription comic site, Sketched at Sketch.com for long form articles, interviews, and the rest of the site's content and its members only form. You can find off panel and Sketched on social media by liking on Facebook at slash Sketched. That's S-K-T-C-H-D. Follow on Twitter and Instagram at, at Sketch Comic or following me at, at Slice Fried Gold. Big thanks to all my existing patrons, including Ben Damstead, Cameron Brown, Rom V, Dem Fitzsimons, Nick Walker, Petra Coyle, Isaac Warren, Scott Carpenter, Rent Narb Studios Comics, Capes and Tights Podcast, Claus Van Deven, Brian, Submit Industries, Raj Patel, Jack Mulqueen, Kyle, Carl Kershaw, Robert Masella, Elza Chartier, Luke Nakashoji, 
Elliot Metz, Dr. Luke, Scott Hazelwood, Scott Buon, Canadian by Proxy, Johnny Cannon, Bradley Rader, Carl Troy, Brandon DePillis, Patrick Brower, Declan Shalvey, Dan Garino, Josh Williamson, Adam Freeman, Ben Wild, Brian Klein Q, SB, Nick Bennett, Daniel Whitfield, Suzanne Apollo, Reed Hinkley Barnes, Mario Tiambang, Andrew Carita, Matt Mahoney, Charlie Chu, Stephen Hall, Pensacola Pop Comics, Kim Eslam, Philip Myra, Christian Shelton, Kenny Porter, Chris Pacello, Torn Grunbeck, Fuzz Bubbles, Christopher Todd, Transmitter Down, Waltz Comics and Books, Carl Mizell, Paul Slates, Akil Wilson, Alex Dimitriopoulos, Terry Dodson, Wesley Gift, Sean Kirkham, Alistair Ross, Julio Anta, Brett A. Schmidt, Jason Goodmanson, Paul Reinwan, Vita Ayala, Tara Ferguson, Dave Slusher, WMQ Comics, Akil, Kokachi, Sean Pinello, Ken Heidelman, Philip Seavey, Al Ewing, Ryan Alcock, David Kelly, Robert Wilson IV, Nick Plato, Brendan Fletcher, Jonathan Nilsson, Matthew Groom, Jason Assey, Adam Bogart, Matthew Taylor, Nick Patera, Jacob Sorelli, Ford Gilmore, David Baraldi, Nick Hall, Bjorn Basin, John Hendricks, Steve Anderson, Ian Maxwell, Cliff Chang, Colin McMahon, Chris Palmer, Scott McGovern, Nathan Fairbairn, Kat McKenzie, Adam Highfield, Fiona Staples, Mark Abnett, Mike Murphy, Michael Shirley, Tom Barnett, Jim Demonakos, Norbert, Nick Lowe, James Kaplan, and Mission Comics Star in San Francisco. You guys are all the best. A quick thanks to Upright T-Rex Music, who wrote and performed Off Panel's theme song just for the show. Check out their music on Spotify because it's completely delightful. Thanks for listening, and tune in next week for another episode. <laughs>